Okay, welcome back to this second last class in the semester. Okay, let me close the door first. Mathematics 113, section 7. This is the last bit of the semester, week number 14. And today's class is day number 27. All together, we have 28 days in the semester. And so I have reserved something very interesting to you. Hopefully, you discover it. Uh, it's the same interesting as I said. Uh, this is a very interesting professor, a professor of physics. Okay, and he retired already. His name is Dr. Alden A. Barnett. Okay, he's the professor emeritus of the Department of Physics at the University of Boulder. Um, actually, it's University of Colorado at Boulder. Okay. Um, I'm going to help you to see uh, an interesting lecture by this professor, all right? And he's helping us to understand the power of the exponential functions, I think. And I would like to invite you for about an hour's attention to listen to what he's going to tell you, all right? So, and I hope that you can get ready a notebook and maybe a pencil or maybe a piece, uh, a piece of paper or something and try to abstract from what he said and try to know how to apply what he said into your learning in this course, okay? It's a very interesting lecture, but it takes an attentive ear to appreciate it, okay? If you want to know the name of this lecture, it's called arithmetic, all right? Populations and energy, okay? Uh, a typical talk in mathematics, the applications of mathematics in today's world. All right? So, are you ready? It takes about an hour and 15 minutes, exactly one class period to do that. And now, um, because it's the second last class, I need to help you understand this. It's very important. So, after that, um, actually, I'm going to share with you in our very last class the result of our end of the semester course survey that we did last time before we administer to you the official student questionnaire, uh, better say the student feedback questionnaire, using 30 minutes of our last class. Okay? Welcome, welcome. You're not going to do the student feedback questionnaire today, uh, which is the official one. According to the advice from the Vice Rector in Academic Affairs, we teachers need to single out 30 minutes time in our very last class and now to get to the student work play of this course to help and to facilitate the completion of the student feedback questionnaire. But today is the second last class, so I make the best use of this second last class to show you this very interesting lecture to me and hope you find same amount of interest that will help to understand the applications of mathematics in today's world. And the name of this lecture is Arithmetic, <coughs> Arithmetic, Populations and Energy. And I hope you will lend your attentive ear to what this professor said. And I hope this is, will be a very good conclusion of the whole semester's work. Okay? Maybe it's a very good beginning for you to appreciate the applications of mathematics in today's world. So here we go. We live along the um, calculus from Professor David Jerison. And today we join Professor Albert Barnett, Professor Emeritus from the Department of Physics, University of Colorado at Boulder. I gave a very interesting talk. So, here we go. Well, it's a real pleasure to be here and to have a chance just to meet with you and talk about some of the problems that we're facing. Now, some of these problems are local, some are national, some are global. But they're all tied together. They're tied together with arithmetic, and the arithmetic isn't very difficult. And what I hope to do is, I hope to be able to convince you that the greatest shortcoming of the human race is our inability to understand the exponential function. So you say, well, what's the exponential function? 
This is a mathematical function that you would write down if you're going to describe the size of anything that was growing steadily. If you had something growing 5% per year, you write the exponential function to show how large that growing quantity was year after year. And so we're talking about a situation where the time that's required for the growing quantity to increase by a fixed fraction is a constant. 5% per year, the 5% is a fixed fraction, the per year is a fixed length of time. Now that's what we want to talk about is ordinary steady growth. Well, if it takes a fixed length of time to grow 5%, it follows it takes a longer fixed length of time to grow 100%. Now that longer time is called the doubling time. We need to know how you calculate the doubling time, and it's easy. You just take the number 70, divide it by the percent growth per unit time, and that gives you the doubling time. So our example of 5% per year, you divide the 5 into 70, you find that growing quantity will double in size every 14 years. Well, you might ask, where did the 70 come from? The answer is it's approximately 100 multiplied by the natural logarithm of 2. If you wanted the time to triple, you'd use the natural logarithm of 3. So it's all very logical. But you don't have to remember where it came from if you just remember 70. Now, I wish we could get every person to make this mental calculation every time we see a percent growth rate of anything in a news story. For example, if you saw a story that said things have been growing 7% per year for several recent years, you wouldn't bat an eyelash. But when you see a headline that says crime has doubled in a decade, you say, my heavens, what's happening? What is happening? 7% growth per year. Divide the 7 into 70, the doubling time is 10 years. But notice, if you're going to write a headline, you never write crime growing 7% per year because most people wouldn't know what it really means. Now, you know what 7% really means. Let's take another example from Colorado. The cost of an all-day lift ticket to ski at Vail has been growing about 7% per year ever since Vail first opened in 1963, and at that time, you paid $5 for an all-day lift ticket. Now, what's the doubling time for 7% growth? 10 years. So what was the cost 10 years later in 1973? 10 years later in 1983, 10 years later in 1993, and what do we have to look forward to? Now this is what 7% means. Most people don't have a clue. Well, let's look at a generic graph of something that's growing steadily. After one doubling time, the growing quantity is up to twice its initial size. Two doubling times, it's up to four times its initial size. Then it goes to 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512. In just 10 doubling times, it's a thousand times larger than when it started. You can see, if you tried to make a graph of that on ordinary graph paper, the graph will go right through the ceiling. Now let me give you an example to show the enormous numbers you get with just a modest number of doublings. Legend has it that the game of chess was invented by a mathematician who worked for a king. The king was very pleased. He said, I want to reward you. And the mathematician said, my needs are modest. Please take my new chess board and on the first square place one grain of wheat. On the next square double the one to make two. On the next square double the two to make four. Just keep doubling till you double for every square. That will be an adequate payment. Oh, we can guess the king thought this foolish man. I was ready to give him a real reward. All he asked for just a few grains of wheat. Well, let's see what's involved in this. We note there are eight grains on the fourth square. Now, I can get this number eight by multiplying three twos together. It's two times two times two. It's one two less than the number of the square. Now, that follows in each case. So, on the last square, I find the number of grains by multiplying 63 twos together. Now, let's look at the way the total is built up. When we have one grain on the first square, the total on the board is one. We add two grains, that makes the total three. We put on four grains, now the total is seven. Seven is a grain less than eight, it's a grain less than three twos multiplied together. Fifteen is a grain less than four twos multiplied together. Well, that continues in each case. So when we're done, the total number of grains, every one grain less than the number I get multiplying 64 twos together. My question is, how much heat is that? You know, that'd be a nice pile here in the studio. Would it fill the building? Would it cover the county to a depth of two meters? How much wheat are we talking about? The answer is it's roughly 400 
times the 1990 worldwide harvest of wheat. Now that couldn't be more wheat than humans have harvested in the entire history of the earth. You say, how do we get such a big number? It was simple. We just started with one grain, but we let the number grow steadily until it had doubled in years, 63 times. There's something else that's very important. The growth in any doubling time is greater than the total of all of the preceding growth. For example, when we put eight grains on the fourth square, the eight is larger than the total of seven that were already there. When we put 32 grains on the sixth square, the 32 is larger than the total of 31 that were already there. Every time the growing quantity doubles, it takes more than all that you use in all of the preceding growth. Now, let's translate that into the energy crisis here. So now, in the year 1975, we'll ask the question, could America run out of electricity? America depends on electricity. Our need for electricity actually doubles every 10 or 12 years. That's an accurate reflection of a very long history of steady growth of the electric industry in this country, growth at a rate of around 7% per year, which goes to doubling every 10 years. Now, with all that history of growth, they expected the growth to just go on forever. Fortunately, it stopped. Not because anyone understood the arithmetic, it stopped for other reasons. But let's ask, what if? Suppose the growth had continued, then we would see here the thing that we just saw in the chessboard. In the 10 years following the appearance of this ad, in that decade, the amount of electrical energy that we would have consumed in this country would have been greater than the total of all of the electrical energy we had ever consumed in the entire preceding history of the steady growth of that industry in this country. Now, did you realize that anything is completely acceptable as 7% growth per year could give such an incredible consequence that in just 10 years, you use more than the total of all that have been used in all of preceding history. Well, that's exactly what President Carter was referring to in his famous speech on energy. One of the statements was this. He said, and in each of those decades, more oil was consumed than in all of mankind's previous history. Now, by itself, that's a stunning statement. Now, you can understand it. The president was telling us a simple consequence of the arithmetic of 7% growth each year in world oil consumption, and that was the historic figure up until the 1970s. Now, there's another beautiful consequence of this arithmetic. If you take 70 years as a period of time and note that that growth is one human lifetime, then any percent growth continues steadily for 70 years gives you an overall increase by a factor very easy to calculate. For example, 4% per year, you find the factor by multiplying four twos together, it's a factor of 16. Now, a few years ago, one of the newspapers here in Boulder quizzed the nine members of the Boulder City Council and asked them, what rate of growth of Boulder's population do you think it would be good to have in the coming year? Now, the nine members of the Boulder City Council gave answers ranging from a low of 1% per year now that happens to match the present rate of growth of the population of the United States. We are not at zero population growth. Right now the number of Americans is increasing by more than 3 million people every year. No member of the city council said Boulder should grow less rapidly than the United States is growing. Now the highest answer any council member gave was 5% per year. Well, you know, I felt compelled. I had to write him a letter and say, did you know? The 5% growth for just 70 years. I can remember when 70 years used to seem like an awful long time. It doesn't seem so long now. But I mean, Boulder's population would increase by a factor of 32. That is where today we have one overloaded sewer treatment plant. In 70 years, we need 32 overloaded sewer treatment plants. Now, did you realize that anything is completely all American? is 5% growth per year could give such an incredible consequence in such a modest period of time. Our city council people have zero understanding of this very simple arithmetic. Let me stop it right here before well, we... Well, a few years ago, I had a class of non-science students who were interested in... We just went through the part one of what the Professor Barrett said. What impressed you most in his speech 
about the applications of mathematics in doing something serious. What is, what is in your mind? You see a chessboard, chessboard, right? A chessboard, the Western chessboard. You have the square. And if you're going to drop the brain on each of this square, and on the second square, you drop twice the amount, and fourth the time, third time, fourth time, fifth time. What, what does the number of grains mean? It's a classic interesting question, you remember that? And I'm going to very through examples in, in this lecture about the applications of mathematics in today's world. And I want you to try to pick and just take some notes about what kind of applications he is referring to using what examples. In part one, just about 10 minutes time, is giving us a lot of connections, okay? About typical things like oil consumptions, the food, all right, the grains. Shall we continue? Populations and energy, all right? So hope you, we can pick up some typical examples there. Problems of science and society. We spend a good deal of time learning to use semi logarithmic graph paper. It's printed in such a way that these equal intervals along the vertical scale each represent an increase by a factor of 10. So you go from 1,000 to 10,000 to 100,000. And the reason you use this special paper is that on this paper, a straight line represents steady growth. Uh, we worked a lot of examples. I said to the students, let's talk about inflation. Let's talk about 7% per year. It wasn't this high when we did this. It's been higher since then. And fortunately, it's lower now. And I said to the students, as I can say to you, you have roughly 60 years life expectancy ahead of you. Let's see what some common things will cost if we have 60 years of 7% annual inflation. Well, the students found that a 55 cent gallon of gasoline will cost $35.20. Two fifty for a movie will be $160. The $15 sack of groceries that my mother used to buy for a dollar and a quarter, that would be $960. A $100 suit of clothes, $6,400. A $4,000 automobile will cost a quarter of a million dollars. And a $45,000 home will cost nearly three million dollars. Well, I gave the students these data. These came from a Blue Cross Blue Shield ad. The ad appeared in Newsweek magazine. And the ad gave these figures to show the cost escalation of gallbladder surgery. In the year since 1950, when that surgery cost $361. I said, make a semi log and make a plot. Let's see what's happening. The students found that the first four points lined up on a straight line whose slope indicated inflation of about 6% per year. But the fourth, fifth, and sixth were on a steeper line, almost 10% inflation per year. Well, then I said to the students, run that steeper line on out to the year 2000. Let's get an idea of what gallbladder surgery might cost. The answer is $25,000. The lesson there is awfully clear. If you're thinking about gallbladder surgery, do it now. In the summer of 1986, the news reports indicated that the world population had reached the number of 5 billion people growing at the rate of 1.7% per year. The reaction of 1.7 might be to say, that's so small. Nothing bad could ever happen at 1.7% per year. So you calculate the doubling time, you find it's only 41 years. More recently, in 1999, you read that the world population had increased from 5 billion to 6 billion people. The good news is that the growth rate had dropped from 1.7% per year to 1.3% per year. The bad news is that in spite of the drop in the growth rate, the world population today is increasing by something over 80 million people every year. Now, if this modest current, 1.3% per year, could continue, the world population would grow to a density of one person per square meter on the dry land surface of the Earth in just 780 years, and the mass of people would equal the mass of the Earth in just 2,400 years. Now, we can smile at those. You know they couldn't happen. This one makes for a cute cartoon. The caption says, excuse me, sir, 
but I am prepared to make you a rather attractive offer for your square. Now there's a very profound lesson in that cartoon. The lesson is that zero population growth is going to happen. Now we can debate whether we like zero population growth or don't like it. It's going to happen, whether we debate it or not, whether we like it or not. It's absolutely certain people do not live with that density on the dry land surface of the earth. Therefore, today's high birth rates will drop. Today's low death rates will rise till they have exactly the same numerical value. That will certainly be in a time short compared to 780 years. So maybe you're wondering what sort of options are available if we want to progress the problem. In the left-hand column, I listed some of those things that we should encourage if we want to raise the rate of growth of population and in so doing make the problem worse. Just look at the list. Everything in the list is as sacred as motherhood. There's immigration, medicine, public health, sanitation. These are all devoted to the humane goals of lowering the death rate. And that's very important to me if it's my death to lower it. But then I have to realize that anything that just lowers the death rate, makes the population problem worse. There's peace, law and order. Scientific agriculture is lowering the death rate due to famine. That just makes the population problem worse. The 55 mile an hour speed limit saves thousands of lives. That makes the population problem worse. Clean air makes it worse. Now in this column are some of the things we should encourage if we want to lower the rate of growth of population and in so doing help solve the population problem. Well, there's abstention, contraception, abortion, small families, stop immigration, disease, war, murder, famine, accidents. Now smoking clearly raises the death rate. Now that helps solve the problem. Well, remember our conclusion from the cartoon of one person per square meter, we concluded that zero population growth is going to happen. Let's state that conclusion in other terms and say it's obvious nature is going to choose from the right-hand list, and we don't have to do anything. Except be prepared to live with whatever nature chooses from that right-hand list. Or we can exercise the one option that's open to us. And that option is to choose first from the right-hand list. We've got to find something here we can go out and campaign for. Anyone here for promoting disease? We now have the capability of incredible war, would you like? More murder, more famine, more accidents. Well, here we can see the human dilemma. Because everything we regard as good makes the population problem worse. Everything we regard as bad helps solve the problem. Now, there is a dilemma ever there was one. And the one remaining question is education. Does it go in the left-hand column or the right-hand column? Well, I'd have to say thus far it's been firmly in the left-hand column. It hasn't done much about reducing ignorance in the column. And nature is already choosing from that right-hand list. You read about the AIDS epidemic. It's devastating the continent of Africa. I had a friend back from Zimbabwe. People, he said, are dying on the streets. Nature is taking care of the problem. So where do we start? Well, let's start in Boulder, Colorado. Here's a graph of Boulder's population. There's a 1950 U.S. Census figure, 1960-1970. In that 20-year period, the average growth rate of Boulder's population was about 6% per year. Now, we've been able to slow the growth somewhat. There's the 2000 census figure. But I'd like to ask the people, let's start with the 2000 census figure and go on another 70 years, one more human lifetime, and ask, what rate of growth of Boulder's population would we need in that 70 years so that at the end of 70 years, Boulder's population would equal today's population of your choice of major American cities? For Boulder, in 70 years, could be as big as Boston is today if we just grew 2.58% per year. Now, if we thought Detroit was a better model, we'll have to shoot for 3.27% per year. And remember the historic figure on the preceding slide, 6% per year. If that could continue for one lifetime, Boulder would be larger than Los Angeles. Now this isn't Boulder, plus Bloomfield, Louisville, Lafayette, the other towns in the county. This was just Boulder. Well, it's obvious you couldn't put 
Los Angeles and the Boulder Valley. Therefore, it's obvious Boulder's population growth is going to stop. Now, the only question is, will we be able to stop it while there's still some open space, or will we wait until it's wall-to-wall -wall people and we're all choking to death? Now, it's interesting to read what the boosters say. Some years ago, we read that doubling its population in 10 years, Boulder is indeed a stable community. What in the world are they talking about? You're going 100 miles an hour, 7% growth per year, doubling in less than 10 years, and someone makes the idiotic statement that we're standing. We're standing still. We're not moving. They don't even understand the meaning of the words that they put down on paper. Well, every once in a while somebody said, but you know, a bigger city might be a better city. And I have to say, wait a minute. We've already done that experiment. We don't need to wonder what will be the effect of growth on Boulder because Boulder tomorrow can be seen in Los Angeles today. And for the price of an airplane test, we can step 70 years into the future and see exactly what it's like. I think if I... Here's this an interesting headline. Very interesting in Los Angeles. That's uh, pause for a minute. Have you ever thought about the population's growth? That's what he said here, the percentage. Well, um, when we say that the populations of Macau is a particular number, and when we say in 10 years' time the populations of Macau is going to reach a certain number, do you know how to put into perspective what he said in terms of a statement he said? Okay, I, I want to give you some time to think about it, because if we, we just go one night this, too many examples, too many ideas over there. So maybe it's time for you to talk about your table to see what impressed you most about what you heard just minutes ago. He is very funny in the sense to point out some outrageous, interesting inconsistency before what's happening and what we report about in the newspaper. Okay? Put in perspective what you heard. Yes. Or you can just try to see, uh, compare with what you're thinking in terms of project questions. And you have to put in statements like this, okay? Or projected figures like this. I, I hate to just one through the video without stopping you to think, all right? Remember, all he talks about are based on some reported figures, okay, from the newspaper, from the television's report, and he take a statement, and he would like to see this make good sense about it. He just points out something which is absolutely inconsistent, all right? And remember, he's using the population as a good example. He's also using energy crisis as another example. Uh, what about you? Rate of change of something. Maybe in a minute I'm going to poll each table to see uh, what exactly uh, he know why at this point for your project problem. Welcome back. Uh, since you came in late, maybe I give you some update of what we're doing. Uh, we're watching a particular video today, which is about the applications of mathematics in today's world. Okay, and he he's a professor giving a lecture to a group of students, and he's using arithmetic, uh, some typical news about populations, some typical news about energy as an example, and from that he's trying to point out the consistency or inconsistency of something. And we're in the middle of the discussion. We have gone through the first part, we're in the second part, all right? So we can try to use the ideas gained from this video and discuss among the members in the table and see what kind of project you're talking about here and if this is going to be useful. Nonetheless, the most important mathematical concept is telling us is exponential function exponential functions, all right?
we, we, we pause to have discussions about what we've learned from the second part of the video, okay? And I try to use the ideas you gain from this video and see if it's going to be useful in the discussions of the project problem. The map behind this is exponential functions. Okay. Maybe uh, during this time of the table-based discussions, I would help to take attendance first. semester, when we talk about mathematics, we often use some symbols and manipulations to help you understand some mechanical rules of doing something. But in this video, the little bit different thing is you don't see a lot of calculations, but a lot of interpretations based on the basic understanding of something. So, uh, Kelvin is here, Jeremy, Jeremy, it's not here yet, Andy, thank you. So, it's going to be very interesting. The more we try to understand from a particular perspective, the more we can appreciate the beauty of applying mathematics in today's world. Now, we are not telling you he's solving a particular piece of problem. But we're trying to tell you that this is how we make the best use of the math we know to understand and make sense of some phenomena. Our population is an example. Energy prices is another example. Statements of growth, particular example, and the map behind this is exponential functions. All right. So I do not know how many groups will use exponential functions as the basis for your project, but in the context of the calculus, the derivative, it could be a very interesting problem. Now we have ever so true the interpretation of exponential functions from the perspective of Professor Newman Sprung from MIT. And this is a very interesting collective lecture from Professor Barnett, our Professor Emeritus from the University of Colorado at Boulder. All right? So in a minute, we'll continue the third part, but I will make sure you have at least five to 10 minutes time for discussions in between each part. Now, we may not have all the time today to finish watching it, but at least it's going to be a good stimulus to help you see how you can proceed with your project, all right? A lot of things here is not only based on quantitative reasoning, but a lot of quantitative reasoning based on some facts and interpretations, okay? Mm -hmm. Angeles, whenever we get there, you can see a spot in the air. 
and then inside the swamp, a lot of toxins. And when people live in this area, it is estimated that how it is going to be dealing, and its lifespan is suffered. Now, today, when we compare Los Angeles to Beijing, we know the problem. Beijing is also um, troubled by not a not clean air problem, a lot of toxins in the air. And when you read this, you need to get some ideas of it. Study said we may clear the toxins in Los Angeles air, the levels of carcinogens as a kind of um, chemicals which is going to induce cancers in air are 426 times the average standard. Now, what about those cities in China? It's very important that we try to use what we learn and interpret something that we read. We don't just take everything that comes to us, we try to reason, use the basic knowledge we have. Now let's see if we can carry on for another 10 minutes of the talk. Okay? In the third part. That headline probably has something to do with this headline. So, well, how are we doing in Colorado? The Denver Post tells us that we're the growth capital of the USA and proud of it. The Rocky Mountain News tells us to expect another million people in the front range in the next 20 years. But in the Post there was an interesting story. Someone was quoted as saying Colorado has a 3% growth rate. That's like a third world country with no birth control. We send foreign aid family planning assistance to countries that have smaller population growth rates than Colorado has. Well, as you can imagine, growth control is very controversial. And I tell you the letter from which these quotations are taken. Now this letter was written to me by a leading citizen in this community. He's a leading proponent of controlled growth. Now controlled growth just means growth. This man writes, I take no exception to your arguments regarding exponential growth. I don't believe the exponential argument is valid at the local level. So you see, arithmetic doesn't hold in Boulder. Now I have to admit, that man has a degree from the University of Colorado. It's not a degree in mathematics, in science, or in engineering. Let's look now at what happens when we have this kind of steady growth in a finite environment. Bacteria grow by doubling. One bacteria divides to become two, the two divide to become four, the four become eight, sixteen, and so on. Suppose we have bacteria that double in number this way every minute. Suppose we put one of these bacteria in an empty bottle at 11 in the morning and then observe that the bottle's full at 12 noon. Now there's our case of just ordinary steady growth. It has a doubling time of one minute. It's in the finite environment of one bottle. I want to ask you three questions. Number one, at what time was the bottle half full? Well, would you believe 11.59, one minute before 12, because they doubled the number every minute. And the second question, if you were an average bacterium in that bottle, at what time? Will you first realize that you are running out of space? Now think about this. This kind of steady growth is the centerpiece of the national economy and of the entire global economy. Think about it. Well, let's just look at the last minutes in the model. At 12 noon, it's full. One minute before, it's half full. Two minutes before, it's a quarter full. Then an eighth and a sixteenth. Let me ask you, at five minutes before 12, when the bottle's only 3% full and is 97% open space just yearning for development, how many of you would realize it was a problem? Now in the ongoing controversy over growth in Boulder, someone wrote to the newspaper some years ago and said, look, there isn't any problem with population growth in Boulder because the writer said, we have 15 times as much open space as we've already used. 
So let me ask you what time was it in Boulder when the open space was 15 times the amount of space we'd already used? And the answer is it was four minutes before 12 in Boulder Valley. Well, suppose that at two minutes before 12, some of the bacteria realize that they're running out of space, so they launch a great search for new bombs. And they search offshore on the outer continental shelf, the overthrust belt, and in the Arctic, and they find three new models. Now, that is a colossal discovery. That discovery is three times the amount of resource they ever knew about before. They now have four models. Before the discovery, there was only one. Now, sure, this will give them a sustainable society, won't it? Well, you know what the third question is. How long can the growth continue as a result of this magnificent discovery? Well, let's look at the score. At 12 minutes, one bottle's filled, there are three to go. 12.01, two bottles are filled, there are two to go. And at 12.02, all four are filled, and that's the end of the line. You don't need any more arithmetic than this to evaluate the absolutely contradictory statements we've all heard and read from experts who tell us in one breath we can go on, increasing our rates of consumption of fossil fuels. In the next breath they say, but don't worry, we'll always be able to make the discoveries and new resources that we need to meet the requirements of that growth. Well, some years ago in Washington, our energy secretary observed that in the energy crisis, we have a classic case of exponential growth against a finite source. So let's look at some of these finite sources. From the work of the late Dr. M. King Hubbard, we have here his semi-logarithmic plot of world oil production. The line's been approximately straight for over 100 years, clear up here to the year 1970. Average growth rate, very close to 7% per year. So it's logical to ask, well, how much longer could that 7% continue? Well, that's answered by the numbers in this table. In the top line, the numbers tell us that in the year 1973, world oil production was 20 billion barrels. The total production in all of history, including that 20, was 300 billion. The remaining reserves, 1,700 billion. Now, those are data. The rest of this table is just calculated out. Assume that the historic 7% growth continued steadily each year following 1973 exactly as it had been for the preceding 100 years. Now, in fact, the growth stopped. Not because of the arithmetic, it stopped because OPEC raised their oil prices. So we're asking, what if? Suppose the growth had continued. Let's go back to the year 1981. By 1981, on the 7% curve, the total usage in all of history would add up to 500 billion barrels, the remaining reserves 1,500 billion. The reserves at that point are three times the total of all that have been used in all of history. That's an enormous reserve. But what time is it when the remaining reserve is three times the total of all you've used in all of history? And the answer is two minutes before 12. Well, we know for 7% growth, the doubling time is 10 years. We go from 1981 to 1991. By 1991, on the 7% curve, the total usage in all of history would add up to 1,000 billion barrels and be 1,000 billion left. At that point, the remaining oil would be equal in quantity to the total of all that we had used in something like 130 years of the oil industry on the surface. By most measures, you'd say that is an enormous remaining reserve. But what time is it when the remaining reserve is equal to all that you've used in all of history? And the answer is it's one minute before 12. So we go one more decade to the turn of the century, that's like right now. That's when 7% would finish using up the oil reserves of the Now let's look at this in a very nice practical way. Suppose the area of this tiny rectangle represents all the oil we used on this earth before 1940. Then in the decade of the 40s, we used this much, that's equal to the total of all that have been used in all of history. In the decade of the 50s, we used this much, that's equal to the total of all that have been used in all of history. In the decade of the 60s, we used this much, and again, that's equal to the total of all the preceding usage. Now here we see graphically what President Carter told us. Now, if that 7% had continued through the 70s, 80s, and 90s, there is what we need. But that's all the oil there is. 
Now, there's a widely held belief that if you throw enough money at holes in the ground, oil is sure to come up. Well, there will be discoveries in new oil. There may be major discoveries, but look, we have to discover this much new oil if we would have that 7% growth continue 10 more years. Well, ask yourself, what do you think is the chance that oil discovered after the close of our class today will be in an amount equal to the total of all that we've known about in all of history? and then realize if all that new oil could be found, that would be sufficient to let the historic 7% growth continue 10 more years. You heard something? That's well, it's interesting to read what the experts say. Here's an interview in Time Magazine with one of the most... You're talking about the predictions of oil consumptions in the United States, in the past two to three decades. Definitely, this is not the latest video, but it's a video based on facts in the past two to three decades. But you can also find some very interesting observations and the interpretations of the figures. Now, before we continue with the fourth part, let's put into perspective what you heard in the third part concerning the barriers of oil consumptions and about the two to three decades predictions. Now, you may not remember all of these, but use your impressions to ask yourself questions of related interest, okay? Well, you need to understand that in every city, or better say in every developing country or developed country, there are certain things that we need constantly. For example, we have automobiles. So we need fuel oils, okay? And today we have to use our gas to cook. So these are the fuels, okay? The question is, how much do we need? And where can we find those? And when we have all those necessary fuels, when are we going to use them up? And if we use them up, when? And in what way? Rate of change. And then we need to find something new. And one of the arguments presented by the uh, observed by the professor stated uh, the outrageous statement predicted by the government at that time, and he used a picture to show you the amount of consumption in the 30, the 40, the 50, the 60, the 70, 80. And when you look at the picture, you see the kind of uh, um, the uh, increase, okay? And how are we going to satisfy the needs of the country? All right? So, you can read a little bit about this. Remember, this is a qualitative interpretation of the use of experience. If you have ever taken the TOEFL exam, you understand in the TOEFL exam, oftentimes there is something called listening comprehensions. Okay, listening comprehensions. And you listen to uh, uh, several minutes of talking, and then you need to check the answers. 
Okay? And uh, they often give you not the right answer, the answer closest to what you heard. Okay, one of the exams that we often have to have to do uh, in a particular subject of this type, well, mostly in the US maybe, and we, we listen to the lectures like this, and the professor will say, now it's time for your quiz. Give you the paper. And based on what you heard, you check the answer. Okay, this is one way to practice our understanding that at the end of completing the, the quiz, the professor scan the quiz paper and then give you the result. How many people got this? How many people got this? How many people got that? And then they try to interpret for you what do you understand by the previous couple of minutes. Now, this is one way to help train our students to understand figures, to observe from the facts, and to use the, the data collected from the class of students to help you understand the meaning of them. Now this is a little bit different today. We can't do it because it's the second half of the class of the semester. But one thing I would like to recommend to you is when we say for learning application mathematics in today's world, we need some training of this kind. We need to understand, not just by watching the video, read the newspaper, read the figures, and try to use our understanding of facts to interpret them. This is just the Bible. Alright? So I do not know if we'll, we could, um, but I think it's important for me to just give you the fourth part. Yes, this is a better story. We are not going to want all of these. There are nine parts in this video, and if we do not stop, it takes about 75 minutes. Since we stop and do five, ten minutes in between, we can only want four parts, I guess, because it's already 3.30. That's complete. The private oil experts in all of Texas. They asked him, but haven't many of our bigger fields been drilled and they dry? He responds saying there's still as much oil to be found in the U.S. as has ever been produced. Now let's assume he's right. What time is it? And the answer is it's one minute before trial. I've read several things this guy's written. I don't think he has any understanding of this very simple arithmetic. Well, in the crisis back in the 70s, ads such as this appeared. This is from the American Electric Power Company. It was a bit reassuring, so they're saying, now don't worry too much, because we're sitting on half of the world's known supply of coal, enough for over 500 years. Now, where did that 500-year figure come from? Well, it may have had its origin in this report to the Committee on Interior and Insular Affairs of the United States Senate, because in that report we find this sentence. At current levels of output and recovery, these American coal reserves can be expected to last more than 500 years. There is one of the most dangerous statements in the literature. It's dangerous because it's true. But it isn't the truth that makes it dangerous. The danger lies in the fact that people take the sentence apart. They just say coal will last 500 years. They forget the caveat with which the sentence started. And what were those opening words? At current levels. Now what does that mean? It means if and only if we maintain zero growth of coal production in this country. So let's look at a few numbers. We go to the annual energy review published by the US Department of Energy. They give this figure as the coal demonstrated reserve base, and it carries a footnote that says about half the demonstrated reserve base is estimated to be recoverable. You cannot recover and use 100% of the coal that's in the ground. So this number is half of this number, and we'll come back to those in just a moment. Now, the report also tells us that in the year 1971, we were mining coal in this country at this rate. 20 years later, 1991, we were mining at this rate. Put those numbers together, and the average growth rate of coal production in those 20 years was 2.86% per year. And so we have to ask, well, how long could a resource last if you had steady growth in the rate of consumption until the last bit of it was used? Well, I'll just show you that equation for the expiration time. I'll tell you, it takes first year college calculus to derive that equation, so it can't be very difficult. You know, I have a feeling there must be dozens of people in this country who have had first-year college calculus. 
So let me suggest, I think that equation is probably the best check of scientific secret of the century. Now let me show you why. If you use that equation, you calculate the life expectancy of the reserve base, or the one half the reserve base is estimated to be recovered for different steady rates of growth. You find if the growth rate is zero, so yes, a small estimate would go about 240 years. The large one would go close to 500 years. So that report to the Congress was correct. But look what we get when we plug in steady growth. Back in the 1970s, we had a national goal of achieving 8% per year growth rate in coal production in the United States. If that could be achieved and continued, coal would last between 37 and 46 years. President Carter cut that goal roughly in half, hoping to reach 4% per year. If that could continue, coal will last between 59 and 75 years. Here's that 2.86 that we just saw, the average for a recent 20 year period. If that could continue, coal would run out between 72 and 94 years. That's what in the life expectancy of children born today. The only way we're going to get anywhere near this widely quoted 500 year figure is to do simultaneously two highly improbable things. Number one, we've got to figure out how to use 100% of the coal that's in the ground. Number two, we've got to figure out how to have 500 years of zero growth of coal production. Now these are simple facts. Just look at those numbers. I got a report recently from the coal fields of Kentucky, West Virginia, and Virginia, these giant bituminous coal fields that supply a large fraction of the electricity in the eastern United States. They estimate that maybe they have another 30 years of coal mining before it will become uneconomical to mine it. And then what will we do when we want to switch on the lights? Um, I think it's very important for us to learn from this part of the lectures that we need to be very sensitive to figures that is being reported on the published media. For example, the newspaper, for example, in the, in the everyday TV news, when we listen to those figures, do you just accept it as a face value? Or do you put into some thinking about it's it reasonable? And if we think it's unreasonable, what can we provide to say, to justify that? My perspective on that is I don't trust it. If you trust the figure or you don't trust the figure, what's the basis of your argument? And I think the, the interesting thing about so much about this video is the professor is very sensitive. Whenever he hears something about some phenomenon, he just simply cannot take it like this. In each of this video that you have watched so far, he's always trying to point out the inconsistency um, between the published media and the facts that he could find. And this makes us feel that it's very good training for us college students. We cannot just simply accept face back. We need to challenge the justifiability of the reported facts based on what. All right? So I can't tell you more, but all of these the professor said, think a little bit about our understanding of the basic arithmetic. Think a little bit more about understanding of functions like exponential functions. And when we are served with facts of this type, what can we do with the training we receive? Particularly from a course of this type, we are interested in the rate of change because we study calculus. The first part of calculus the derivative, the application of the derivative. And we are interested in knowing the maximum, the minimum. And we know something about the Gogo extrema, the Noko extrema. We seem to understand how to find those values, but we've never tried to set the stage in such a 
will like applications that we can actually apply those concepts to make sense of our knowledge. So I hope this video, which if you're interested, you can watch it at home, which is located in day number 20 in the Buddha environment, and use it as the basis to stimulate your understanding of what you have learned in this semester. Now, I cannot tell you that there's no keyword like calculus in this video, but from different examples presented by the professor, you can feel that if we consider ourselves as an educated person in this field, in particular, after taking this course, general education course, and the applications of mathematics in today's world, do we have this nice sense of this sensitivity to reported figures um, when we come to the considerations of how much we can apply what we have learned? Okay, I think I. I've, I've said enough today, and uh, I do not want to continue uh, with just watching this video without much thinking on your part. So allow me to adjust the attendance for a number of you who came in late, and then i let you ask questions about your project, which is going to be due on the 27th of this week, okay, of this month, which will be, today is the 24th, Friday is 27th, right? So uh, by 11.55, Friday, you need to submit your team-based project, including the proposal, the report, which is the constructed solutions, and a PowerPoint, which contain your problem, why it's important to you, and the solutions, and how to make sense of it, okay? So it's going to be a little bit of a challenge. And Friday is the last day of this semester, as far as this class is concerned, because Monday is um, the last day of the semester that we do not have classes. And so we are going to invite you, uh, when you come back on Friday, to finish the official student feedback questionnaire using your student web links, course-based link there. Uh, in class, I will sing all 30 minutes time for you to do that. And after that, I will help to provide a review of this course and give you some guidelines on how to write your final exam. So today, allow me to adjust the attendance. We're okay. here. Uh, Wacky, are you here? No, Stella. Thank you. Go back. And then, um, let's see. Vivian, not here. Jeanette, not here. All right, so let me say this first. Jeremy, not yet. Okay, then we got the attendance set. So, if you have any questions about your project, you can ask me. If not, it's a very good time for you to have a table based discussions on how to wrap things up. Alright? So, at the beginning of the class, someone asked me is it possible for us to use some of the existing example and change a little bit? My response is it's your proposal, you're going to tell me what you do. Uh, I'm not telling you if you can change a little bit of the example and use it as the project. This is not a good way to ask questions, but I highly recommend that you use the example as the basis to formulate your possible problem. And I'd love to hear more of the qualitative interpretations of your group on your problem, rather than just a media repetitions of the problem solutions process that you learn from a mechanical textbook. Alright, so that's the reason why I saw you this video. Lightly knowledge from what you've learned. Okay? So if you do have, not have any questions, I'm going to stop the camera. But if you still have questions, you can raise your hand and come to your table. Alright?